Things just keep getting worse for Intel. EVGA is proud to announce their all-new XR1 OBS certified 4K capture card. Record at 1080p60 while you game at 4K60 with HDR with advanced pass-through mode that allows you to switch to 144Hz refresh rate at the press of a button, meaning no longer do you need to disconnect or disable to get the full capabilities of your display. To see the full list of capabilities and configurations, click the EVGA link in the description below. So last week when I did the 5900X and 5950X videos, there was a lot of people asking, Jay, where are the more affordable options? Why aren't you covering the 5600X and the 5800X? Well, for whatever reason, AMD decided not to send us the CPUs until the day of launch. So here we are now, which is kind of fine because we've had time to sort of see how the audience has re received Zen 3's architecture. We already know based on our 5900X video and 5950X, how well the core architecture's improvement is done versus Intel's 10900K offering. But we know most people, most people really are not buying $500 CPUs uh, or $750 CPUs, depending on which of those two that we covered already you uh, are considering buying. But we know that $300 is a, is a very good high-end mid-range, if you will. So if you take that range of middle ground, where it really is the battleground of competition between any brand, whether it be graphics cards, CPUs, or whatever, um, if you take a look at what's taking place there, that is where many people buy in terms of their budgets. Now, that used to be almost the best that you could get for 300 bucks when it comes to mainstream. It's not that long ago when four cores and eight threads was the best you could get unless you moved up to the extreme platform for Intel. And then that was obviously before Zen 1 launched and then Threadripper right after it. Uh, four cores and eight threads, that was it. Well now, 300 bucks for AMD gets you six cores, 12 threads. Doesn't sound like a whole lot more when you talk about, you know, compared to, you know, four core, eight threads years ago. But more importantly than the core count is things like its IPC or instructions per clock. Uh, the cache architecture, the arrangement of the CCXs, or in this case, a single CCX, and we'll talk about the benefits of that in a moment, versus uh, Intel giving you actually two more cores and four more threads than this guy for about $80 more. So one thing you have to know when it comes to the way that we did our comparison with this particular lineup is unlike the 10900K and the 5900X, it is, it's not directly comparable in terms of pricing. So it's about $80 more to go with a 10700K versus a 5600X, which made us really start to wonder like, okay, what? so who's buying and who's not? This, is a, this was an interesting one. And I think it's actually very relevant to most people. So it's also important to point out that in our samples, it's also the only CPU that came with a cooler. So there's already a benefit because the 10700K, as you know, does not come with a cooler. So this is $80 cheaper. Uh, you can get the 10, I know I keep pointing here, it's not a 10700K, but these are props for a reason. The 10700K is $320 at Micro Center, not a sponsor of today's video, um, but if you live near a Micro Center, you already know you can buy uh, CPUs for under cost there. And you go there and you get crazy bundle deals and stuff, which makes it even more ridiculous as to how beneficial uh, and price com competitive that they are. It's about $380 pretty much everywhere else. But it's not a very intricate cooler. It's just a chunk of aluminum heat sink with the uh, thermal paste pre-applied. There's no copper core, there's no heat pipes, there's no vapor chamber. It's got, uh, it's only a 65 watt part. And that's six cores, 12 threads at 65 watts. So you can see the efficiency improvements that we talked about in our initial video are clearly working their way down the stack. Um, not a very hot part. We had a 280 millimeter AIO hooked up to it, the Fractal Design Cell CS Plus. Um, and it's, it's 55C, spoiler alert, was the hottest it got under the most strenuous loads. And that's six cores and 12 threads at 65 watts. So already amazing right there. But we got a lot to talk about. So I know you guys hate when I talk a lot before the benchmarks. Let's go and show you the numbers versus a 10700K so that you can see how it compares to a, pri a, a, a CPU that is $80 more, which when you're comparing a $300 CPU to something $80 more, that's a big chunk of price. It's like something like 27% more expensive. Actually, let me do the math. I wanna know for sure what it is now. 26.6, yeah. 27% I math in my head. Yeah, so 26.6% uh, more expensive is what the 10700K is versus the 5600X, if my math is correct, which means, is it 26.6% faster than the 5600X.
So it should be no surprise whatsoever though that anything that leverages all core uh, horsepower or multi-threading is faster on a 10700K. It should be. It's two cores, four threads more with a higher clock speed. Now, when we do our standardized IPC test, that's where we slow all the CPU cores down to four gigahertz, which is kind of funny. We just arbitrarily picked that number because it was an even number and it turns out AMD, AMD did the same thing. They didn't advise us on how to do this test. Four gigahertz, single core for Cinebench, 420 versus a 515. So you can see already. And, and by slowing down the 5600X to four gigahertz, that's whacking quite a, I think it's uh, seven or six or 700 megahertz off of its maximum speed. So locked core for core, it is 95 points faster or higher than Intel. So that's your IPC test. That's instructions for clock, clock for clock. You can see AMD just gets more done in the same amount of time, if you will. Uh, when we look at things like Blender and Fishy Cat, I mean, Intel's faster simply because of the fact that it has more cores, more threads, and those are multi-threaded, which is fine because one of the things that I was reading was that the 5600X is what a lot of people were being recommended for anyone wanting to build a primarily gaming CPU that can also do multi-threaded uh, performance well or tasks well, live stream, video encoding, all that sort of stuff. And there, there's some interesting things to think about when it comes to upgrade path of adopting either one of these platforms. Because the person watching this video is probably not running either of these this hardware, to be honest. If you're running a 10700K, you're not gonna go out and buy a 5600X. There's no point, that's a, that's a lateral, slightly backwards move, as you can see here, if uh, compared to multi-threading performance. Let's talk about Warp Stabilize and Premiere. First of all, when we do Premiere, they're very, very close. In fact, 17 seconds difference on our 4K render test with the same file and everything, the same timeline. 17 seconds it, when you're talking 500 versus 517 seconds is not a huge difference. If you were making a living off of your rendering uh, rig, you wouldn't be running this hardware anyway, I don't think. You'd be running something much higher end, getting the job done much faster because time is money when it comes to rendering if you're a rendering professional like that. This, these are, this is not your hardware. But when it comes to Warp Stabilize, because that is a single threaded action, it was significantly faster than the 5600X. 106 seconds versus 131. And that comes down directly to that IPC once again. Games are also going to definitely benefit from that IPC. One thing we noticed here, when we compared the 10700K to the 5600X, the 5600X in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it was faster in 1080p. And I think that comes down once again to the IPC. Um, we are running a RTX 3090 graphics card on there with its power limits maxed because we're trying to introduce as much of a bottleneck as we can to see which CPU can handle it better. Metro Exodus was a dead heat, 165 FPS average on both. One thing worth noting is on Metro Exodus, at 1080p, we had a higher maximum FPS on the 5600X and a lower minimum. Now keep in mind, our minimums that we show here, they're not 1% lows or 0.1% lows. It is the minimum frame. So they should be kind of taken with a grain of salt. That's just what the benchmark spits out. It's that one frame. And if only one frame out of 10,000 is that number, that's not indicative of your, of your stuttering or low FPS performance. That's why 0.1% and 0.1% lows exist. And then Far Cry 5, it's one of those where we saw a, uh, a, a the 10700K just seems to be favored in that particular title. I think that just has something to do with the fact that you had two more cores, four more threads, and still a higher clock speed than 5600X. Some titles just do leverage certain hardware better than others. All right, so with all that said, who should be buying this? Who's interested? Well, I'm assuming the person that's watching this and is getting ready to pull the trigger is someone on older hardware than either of, of these platforms are. And you're, you're trying to determine which is better for you, Intel or AMD. And this is a harder decision to make, I think, than the 5900X versus 10900K. The 5900X at the same price point than the 10900 if you can get it for a non-scalped price, scalping being the new norm now for everyone in CPU hardware launches, has two more cores and four more threads than Intel. But at this price comparison, although $80 cheaper, you've got two cores less, four threads less than Intel. So it makes it a lot less cut and dry. If you, for the same amount of money, can get more hardware and you know that hardware is faster, that's a win. And that was an easy win for 5900X. So you gotta ask yourself, one, what system are you building? Are you building just a gaming rig? Are you building something that is gonna be doing a lot of multitasking and you need the leverage of, of the multi-core? 
My recommendation to that person looking for the best multi-threaded performance is gonna be leaning towards the 10700K, simply for the fact that it has, again, two cores, four threads more. It does have a higher clock speed, although it does suffer for IPC, so that extra clock speed does help, because one thing that's different this time around on AMD's lineup, the higher up the product stack you go, the higher the turbo frequency gets, and that wasn't the case in the past. In the past, we're used to seeing more core count equal less core speed because of one, power limitations and thermal limitations. But because of the IPC improvements, because of the efficiency improvements of Zen 3, and the way that the CCXs are now arranged, we are able to see more clock speed as thread count increases. So that's something that's really new this time around. The 10700K though, however, it's, it's interesting because if you're sitting on a B450 or an X470 motherboard or a newer, you can upgrade to this CPU without needing a motherboard change. However, every single generation of Intel after the 300 series, we're talking about Z370 and Z390, requires a new motherboard to go along with it. So what I've got right here is an 8700K. This is our old test bench. It's what used to be our Intel test rig. If you wanted to get a 9900K, you needed a new motherboard. If you're sitting on an 8700K like we are right here, or a 9900K, and you want 10th gen, which is what the 10700K is, you need a new motherboard. So the AMD user that's sitting on a generation old hardware in terms of motherboard is still capable of upgrading to your uh, 5000 series CPU without needing an entire platform upgrade. You can just buy the new CPU, update your BIOS before you swap it, throw it in and you're done. But you're still gonna get all the benefits of PCIe 4.0, which you do currently don't have on Intel, which is something that's gonna be on its Rocket Lake, which again, will more than likely need a new motherboard to go with it. So it's starting to look more and more like AMD's promise of sticking with AM4 platform for five years is obviously not holding them back on what they can do on the substrate or the pins, and two, just giving you so much more value. The 5600X is looking as powerful as it does in gaming because of the fact that it's a single CCX. There's no Infinity Fabric to worry about, there's no CCX handoff, there's no scheduler to worry about in Intel or in Microsoft uh, Office, Microsoft Windows. Um, that's something we have not even talked about yet is the fact that 5000 series doesn't have an AMD Ryzen scheduler. That is something you had to always make sure that you downloaded in the past. You had to go to AMD's website, get the chipset drivers, then you would unlock the power profiles for Windows to, get, to make the most of the platform. But 5000 series, that's not the case anymore. You can still do it and have a power profile option there if you want. However, AMD and during a Q&A has come out and said, it's not there anymore because it's not necessary. So we're just seeing it truly age extremely well. And I think because of the fact that it's a single CCX uh, is why the gaming performance is so strong. Remember, gaming mode on multi-CCX CPUs from AMD in the past would usually disable a CCX to give you better performance because of latency. And that's exactly what you're getting here because it's a single CCX. Now, yes, the 5800X is also a single CCX, eight cores, but it's also $449 for two cores four threads more, making it more expensive than 10700K core for core, probably obviously beating it across the board, but less of a proposition value if you're looking at building an amazing mid-range CPU that's gonna get all of it done. And if AMD decides to come out with another slight family refresh of these CPUs in the future and still support AM4, you probably have an upgrade path available to you as well if you're on a 500 series motherboard. We still don't know yet what the future is gonna hold in terms of the socket. They did say that the socket does have to be phased out uh, in the coming generation. So it's gonna be time will tell on exactly what kind of support this is gonna be. Is it gonna be a Zen 3.5 like they did Z Zen 1.5? Who knows? I think right now, all of our ears are to the ground listening for what's coming for Threadripper. Phil specifically, because he's running a Threadripper system and he can't wait to see this IPC make it to that core count. And the first thing he's gonna do is go run Geekbench, I know him. He geeks out over that Geekbench score because he likes seeing all the digits. Oh yeah. <laughs> done. Speaking of done, we're pretty much done with this video. So what do you guys think of the 5600X? Now I'm not segueing like Linus. He's over here dying like I'm about to segue into some ad. Now we already showed the ad at the beginning. We don't double dip yet. We don't have enough employees for that. He said yet. <laughs> I don't know the future. I don't know the future. I didn't know the future. I didn't expect AMD to ever catch up like this. Speaking of AMD catch, catching up though, Radeon's next. That's gonna be a good one. Sound off down below. 5600X or 10700K for you. Vote, go, now.